Today we're down in the County Board of Supervisors meeting rooms on the 8th floor on Temple Street in downtown Los Angeles. And today we're with the gentleman who's been serving on the Board of Supervisors the longest, Mike Antonovich. Over 41 years in public life, serving in the Assembly, the Community College Board, and for the last 30-something years, representing the area north of the uh, San Fernando Valley, uh, including Lancaster and Palmdale, a uh, big portion of Los Angeles. I've known Mike about 35 years, met him through some other people, watched him, and I've always been kind of fascinated by him because he's uh, not the typical kind of politician. He hasn't been beat by anybody in all these years. He has run for other office and not been successful, but that usually happens to everybody. So we're going to explore his life here in Los Angeles, public policy issues such as the metro and the subway and light rail, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the budget crisis with the state of California and how he gets along with his colleagues on the Board of Supervisors and why he loves this business so much as supervisor for Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors. I want to start off with this courthouse named after you because as I recall, Mike, usually bu buildings are named after dead people, and you look very alive to me. So how did, I read a little bit, tell me a little bit more about this, this building, this uh, county courts uh, building in your district, named after you, a living politician. Well, what happened, the Antelope Valley had been underserved for decades, and they needed a new courthouse, and no one was really fighting for them. As a result, through a good team effort, we were able to get that courthouse up, operating, and the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court came to the dedication. So the judges there, in appreciation, recommended that the courthouse be named after me, a non-attorney. Well, that's a first, too, because usually they're named after, right. after judges. Um, tell me a little bit about South Central Los Angeles, Mike Antonovich. Was, was it a large black community then, as you grew up as a little boy in, in this community? Or, I mean, how did, you, how did you do? Or is this the beginning of learning how to work with all different groups and races? Well, I, I grew up in Manchester and Central, South Central Los Angeles. Went to Russell Elementary School on Firestone Boulevard, which is Manchester Boulevard, but it becomes Firestone because the Firestone Rubber and Tire Company plant was there. And I was a member of the Willowbrook uh, Scouts uh, as a Cub Scout, and then Edison Junior High in South Central, which uh, I was a member of Troop 540 Boy Scouts, Goodyear Rubber and Tire Company. And when I graduated from uh, junior high school, then my family moved to the northern part of the city of Los Angeles, and I went to John Marshall High School, uh, coming from Fremont High School to John Marshall High School. But my, uh, all my friends uh, growing up have come from every ethnic uh, background, so uh, this is uh, just growing up in Los Angeles. That was one of my, uh, let's say, a great advantage in that I have friends in all those communities. And what's interesting, we still have a group from Edison and Russell Elementary School mm -hmm. and Fremont and Huntington Park because my classmates went to both those high schools. Uh, we get together every few months for lunch, a little reunion. And I'm very proud of the success that my, uh, my classmates have done. My, your, staff, achieved. your staff tells me you're a little bit of a basketball player. Now, how did you do with in that community as a white guy, a uh, white young man in basketball with a primarily ethnically based uh, community? Um, well, we didn't look upon it as uh, you know, ethnically diverse. We were just all kids growing up. It's kind of like um, the little rascals, let's say. Uh, we were all together. We were all equal. We all participated, and I was able to have some athletic abilities. So this was before then I would call it racial-based politics. Oh, absolutely. Which I think got really ugly. Oh, absolutely. Still is ugly today. Absolutely. Uh, you didn't have it. You'd see a black face, a white face, a Croatian face, whatever. You guys were all just faces. We are just all Americans. Yeah, yeah. All Angelinos, yeah. all trying to make it. I saw in, in, in one of the piece here, Mike, that... Uh, Henry Waxman and you were in the same class. Right, Edison Junior High School. Now, did you have any idea? Uh, Henry's not the most handsome man uh, uh, running around. You know, so many politicians, you being pretty 
pretty attractive. Oh, sure, sure. So, uh, <laughs> did you ever think that Henry Waxman would become a, one of the most powerful Cong congressional Democrats in the nation at that time? Did you well, see that about him? No one thought anyone was going to be really anything. We were just students pursuing our education. Um, Stan Jones, the uh, sports commentator, the news commentator, he was student body president at Edison Junior High School. Uh, many of the famous uh, singers in the rock and roll groups uh, came from our, from our class. And um, Richard Berry, who graduated from Jefferson High School, who wrote the song Louie Louie, uh, all of these individuals, you know, growing up in the same area. Arnie Steinberg, uh, his brother Herb and I were in the same class. Arnie the pollster. Arnie, yeah. the he was the political cons consultant for Senator James Buckley, and uh, he's my uh, political uh, pollster. Works in my campaigns. Right. Uh, I know, and, good and, guy. And Alan Hoffenblum. But, right. um, but uh, uh, the Steinberg family, they were in South Central Los Angeles too. Now, who would have thought that maybe Henry Waxman, Arnie Steinberg, or myself would one day uh, be making public policy? That wasn't really, um, it wasn't there. But I would say in the fifth grade, I had a wonderful I was ask you teacher, about Ms. Schaefer. Mrs. Sarah Schaefer. And that's Ed Cray's mother, if you know Ed. And um, she followed me and mentored me until she passed away just a few years ago in her 90s. And then in the eighth grade, Mrs. Uh, Carlisle was our government teacher, social studies teacher. And that was in middle school. That's uh, junior high school, Edison. And Henry Waxman was in that class as well. Um, and that's when the national conventions were on television. You know, television was still not just coming in vote. Right, right. And watching the, observing the Republican and Democrat conventions. At that time, you had Estes Kefauver and Adlai Stevenson, so you had the coonskin caps and the hold in your shoe. And then you had uh, General Eisenhower and Senator I like Taft. Ike. I like Ike Buttons. And so you had this uh, dynamics taking place and learning about the social studies. It, it sparked an interest, and from that, my fifth grade teacher encouraged me to continue um, with my pursuit for uh, teaching and also to get involved in elected office. I'm going to make an analogy here I hadn't thought about before, but um, you obviously didn't have a lot of money in your first campaign for public life, no. and I can tell you personally, I know your colleague, Xavier Oslovsky, hardly had anything. In like fact, the first thing we did with him is to take him to a Sears and buy him a Johnny Miller suit because he, <laughs> did, he didn't know how to dress. You can't dress like that, Zeb. And luckily, John, Johnny Miller suits weren't that expensive at that time. So how did you approach... Who was that? The, the Johnny Miller replaced Jim Clinton? <laughs> well, it was at Sears. <laughs> they had a deal with him. John, you know, Johnny Miller was a very attractive guy and a great golfer. Oh, John okay. Miller, and uh, Johnny Miller. Well, John Cl uh, Jim Clinton got two pairs of pants, remember? <laughs> well, how do you know about all this I stuff? I remember all these television programs, you know? <laughs> Zachary Hall, did remember you, the little yeah, man in the back, the, the tailor, does it all himself? <laughs> well, we still have Cal Worthington. He's still <laughs> He's on, still going. He's like 90. a 98. He's got to be. And he flies his own airplane. <laughs> yeah, well, that makes me worried. <laughs> I hope he doesn't fly over your district. <laughs> so, um, anyway. You just have to eat more bugs in your life. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mike, what... Uh, Tell us just a little bit of the beginning of your first campaign, <clears throat> and uh, where'd you raise the money? You were on a shoestring budget because as a school teacher, there was no even pack then. I know, you know, for the United Teachers of LA or whatever. So what did you do? How did you approach it? Well, what happened? Sarah Schaefer uh, contacted me that there's going to be a new position opening up, a new uh, election for trustee of the Los Angeles Community College District, and they were going to be separated from the LA Unified School District and that I should uh, consider running for that office. And so I talked to a few people and they said, didn't sound like a good deal or whatever, and, but uh, Sarah thought it was good and I thought it would be a good idea too. So I filed. Turns out 139 people filed that. for that office. Including I mean, Jerry Brown. Including Jerry Brown. And uh, so seven of us formed a little coalition uh, Bill Orozco, who was the first Hispanic Republican chairman of the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. uh, Bob Klein, who later became an assemblyman. Uh, Marion LaFollette, who became... Who ran against Corman one time. Did he? Okay. Klein, yeah. And he, she was uh, also elected to the state assembly. And, uh, and myself. And, and, but so there were seven. So we ran as a, a slate. And, and we didn't have that much money. It was all shoe leather. Seven, the sensible seven. 
That's what you called it. They called it the Who came up with that? Do you remember? No, I don't. It just somehow it popped up. up. Popped up. So we went to all the various community groups, uh, service clubs, et cetera, and hit, here comes the election. And election night, I run number one in the unincorporated areas. Jerry Brown runs number one in the city of Los Angeles area. And the two of us really outpaced the others. So we do one and two. And so the top 14 ran in the runoff. For seven so, seats. For seven seats. And once again, Brown and I were at the head of the pack. And uh, so we had seven people elected. And it was a very interesting experience because from that position, uh, you had a number of state legislators. Uh, you had, had a district attorney, Ira Reiner. You've had congressional people uh, being elected from that position on the Community College Board of Trustees. How did you get on with Jerry then? We got along well. I mean, uh, philosophical differences. Well, yeah, Jerry was not as um, hardworking, let's say. I mean, <laughs> um, but what Jerry taught me was philosophical. You no, know, well, he, Jerry living in Laurel Canyon. Sometimes, so, yeah, right, right. <laughs> also in Echo Park. <laughs> yeah. Um, but he he taught me the media because he orchestrated the media so well and how you would get your message in radio, on radio, right. and television, and the, and the print media. So I learned from him his uh, abilities to exercise the media for his, his uh, recognition. Well, I remember that you bring up some great names there, and the Ira Reiner was very successful electorally, right. um, and uh, Rosco. And let's switch now to where you are, and you've been here now for a few years. A few years. <laughs> um, well, then, then I was then elected in '72 to the state legislature. That's right. You did the assembly, right? And I was uh, underspent. And uh, who did you beat? Uh, uh, Gary Gerard. Uh, he had. I was the Los Angeles boy, and he was the Glendale anointed one. And so I was outspent, but we outworked him through precinct operations. And then that precinct operation was a man by the name of Dana Rohrbacher, who's oh now a goodness. congressman. Oh, wow, Sean Steele, who's national committee uh -huh. man. Ed Royce, who is a congressman and subcommittee these were chairman. These all working on the They worked in my, for you? in my precincts, yes. And uh, uh, you had a few others that... Uh, uh, were in the state, eventually became elected to the state legislature. And these were college students from USC and other colleges that did the precinct operation because the way you win elections is by working the district and meeting the people. Get out the vote. And, and not That's the right. day or week before the election, but you have to build a, a right. grassroots campaign. Right. Lots of time, lots, it's not fun. No. It's hot during the summer before November. It's not, not enjoyable at all. All right, so now we're sitting here, top of the building here, Kenneth Hahn, who you serve with. Give me a couple of thoughts about Kenny Hahn. Kenny was a, a good man. Uh, he was also my councilman when I was growing up because uh, where it's we lived, Central, that was yeah. his district. And he was a hard working. He worked his district very well. He was respected in his district. He was not a, a gold brick where he just comes in late and leaves early, like some people do. Mm -hmm. uh, so I respected his work ethic and his commitment to his district. And he was very constructive on, a, on dealing with personnel issues and others. So he was a very fine colleague to work with. And he was in primarily in a black community and yet had, had such good relationships, building these coalitions with people and organizations mm -hmm. and so on. I remember a number of black politicians tried to run him out. They were not successful. No, he would win in the primary. They were not. Like, <laughs> he didn't get it over. Yeah. fifty plus one goodbye. Right, right. In the, in the but start. he he earned it because he worked with the people, and after the election, he kept working right. with the people. That, I mean, great right. work ethic. Right, he's a good exactly. man. 